You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe, how to plant a food forest, restorative design, or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. And this is Jill Cloutier at 91.9 FM in Santa Barbara, KCSB, and I'm on the phone with Mark Lakeman. Mark, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Oh, great. And let me give an introduction to Mark. Mark Lakeman is a visionary architect and co-founder of City Repair. City Repair is in Portland, Oregon. It combines architecture, urban planning, anthropology, community development, public art, permaculture, and ecological design in projects that transform public space. Founded in 1996, City Repair was conceived as an antivirus to combat isolation and over-commodification of conventionally designed cities by literally inserting villages into cities. Mark Lakeman is trained as an architect. He's um, the creative director of the ecological design firm Communitexture, and each spring he coordinates the Village Building Convergence, where architects, planners, and artists come together for 10 days of concentrated work with neighborhood residents and volunteers. So, Mark, welcome to Sustainable World. Thanks, Jill. Could you tell us what City Repair is for those people who are listening and don't know? Well, I was thinking about this question this morning, and um, the best way to answer it is, is that it is the repair of the city. Um, <laughs> But in order to really understand my answer, uh, people have to really be uh, as familiar as they can be with how cities work and what it is that they like about them as well as what it is that frustrates them. And um, the sh- another way to answer that question would be to say, well, if people are frustrated by their um, what is generally the case in every, at least Western city, um, their lack of participation, then the repair of the city, in our point of view, is is really just to increase participation, to increase the citizen voice, um, to increase the citizen vision in the decisions that happen um, on a daily basis and uh, in terms of big decisions and small ones, incidental ones that happen all the time. Um, but we're not talking about inserting more bureaucracy or making things harder. In fact, our vision is that it becomes easier. Um, and the notion of of bureaucracy lessens because there's ultimately when people are directly involved in the fa- affairs of their, their own lives um, and they're making choices from a value place or a place that is informed by direct experience, they tend to be more effective and efficient than um, than sort of third party intermediary um, officials or, or bureaucrats. So that's another way to answer it. Another way to say, is to say that, well, if there's really anything wrong with the city, what's right about it is people. And it's only people that are making the choices. Um, but a lot of times, communities simply aren't engaged. Like, for instance, it takes a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of advocacy simply to get a speed bump created in our neighborhood um, when neighbors know perfectly well that cars are speeding. But uh, on the other hand... In an afternoon, a group of neighbors could go out and create one um, for much, much less the cost. Um, but it, again, it's not that simple, um, but that's an example of how different it could be. We're also isolated in the city, I think, and we've had neighbors for years. We don't even know them. So is it just more um, coming together and taking control of where you live and wh- where you are? Yeah, that's, um, that's a big theme for us is to recognize that the design of the city, as, as it has um, been created over time does tend to isolate people and it's um quite ironic because you can find yourself living among thousands or even millions of people and feeling lonely you could maybe feel less lonely out in the country or in a wilderness than you feel amongst so many people and i think part of the loneliness is that they're there and you don't know them and that hurts that hurts a lot of people who um 
whose inherent nature is to want to feel like they belong and that they are in connection to um, other scales of, of self or community. So, yeah, the, the, the isolation is quite acute. In, in the United States, it might be the most intense. Uh, well, it is the most intense of all first world nations because we have the fewest number of outdoor gathering places in, of all first world nations and the highest incidence of crime and uh, evidence of social isolation in the world. In fact, sometimes it's ten times higher than other first world nations. There are reasons for this. And Mark, did you do you think most of us are just we're not aware of this and we're living our lives and maybe feeling lonely and not knowing other people are feeling the same way? And how did you become aware of this and want to change things? What prompted this um, your beginning city repair? Well, first of all, I will say that it's normative. People experience it as normal. In fact, you can pick up a psychology one oh one book in any university and they'll and they're and they're sitting there kind of describing human nature to you based upon their their studies of Americans. Um, I don't I don't put much stock in that stuff anymore because I've experienced a very different um, human condition in the cultures that I visited across the world, especially um, so-called pre-industrial people who um, tend to lack the kinds of, um, I don't know, I'd say social aberrations that uh, emerge in an urban culture that is characterized by so much work and actually so little participation in decision-making and such stress placed upon families and individuals. It, it creates a different human condition, um, but it's not fair, I would say, to judge human nature, um, only how human nature is behaving in those conditions. But for me, part of, part of how I've learned a lot about this is really just by... I mean, I finally got to a point where I, I had to leave our culture for a while and take a break. Um, but it wasn't to go rest. It was to go look around. I was working in a large corporate architecture firm in, in Portland, and we were used to doing large, very large multi-million dollar buildings, huge things. One day, it was sort of jokingly disclosed that uh, the biggest contractor in the state of Oregon was rut routinely... Um, paying off inspectors and covering up toxic waste problems on sites. And this one that they were joking about, the vice president of that company was joking about, was right on the edge of our, of the, of the heart of our region, the Willamette River. And um, it wasn't just the way he was joking. It was the fact that the way he was joking made me realize that this sort of thing was happening all over the place, that he could be so brazen as to say this in front of me, and he, he didn't even know my name. So I, was, I wasn't really disillusioned. I just sort of divorced my own profession that day and went traveling for about seven years, sort of living hand to mouth, um, not just determined not to return until I had found a lot of different places where people lived with a deeper commitment to their families and their communities and to their, you know, to their bioregion. I didn't know the word bioregion at the time, um, but what I was looking for was the social basis of sustainability, commitment, um, deep identity, uh, a strong sense of commitment to a place. And um, I don't know, it was, I think I was looking for evidence really of love, of, of people who really are living in a deeper sense of appreciation with their, you know, like using their lives for some sort of higher higher purpose where they're not asking themselves all the time you know what's the meaning of life why are we here like that's what you ask yourself when you're profoundly unhappy and you yeah. feel isolated yeah i think people here are working nonstop, and when they have a chance to slow down it's just they don't like what they they feel inside it's so ironic um because all of that hard work uh it's mostly i mean it's just, it's about sustainability in a different way like just to make sure you pay the rent so you can s sustain your house or sustain your sense of need, whether it's a real need or a perceived need or a need to feel like you're someone. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it, it's very different in other places where they don't seem to need no, so much, but they find more in each other and uh, in a sense of relationship to their place. They... I mean, I've experienced cultures where people work only a few hours a day, and they're healthier and stronger and brighter, and they certainly laugh more often, and the relationship to their children is better. 
Um, I mean, it, you, I think it's really important to look at something like your own personal social index and ask yourself, you know, if you're getting, a, if you're getting what you want out of life. And if you're not, um, it's time to make a switch. And we do have choices. Even within this culture, we have choices. We can simplify our lives. We can shed all of the stuff we're carrying around. Some people are carrying, metaphorically speaking, boulders on their back, and um, those can be dropped. Do you feel that in the U.S. now there are more alternatives than when you left and you're just kind of like, I've had it with this place and I need to go on a pilgrimage? It's almost like you went on a pilgrimage. Do you feel that there are alternatives for people now if they want to change their lives? Yeah. I See, I travel a lot around the country, um, maybe three or four different cities uh, a month now. And it's actually quite tiring. But it's also quite inspiring because one of the things I'm seeing is an answer to that question. I'm seeing that in every single city there are pockets across each town and each city of people. Um, sometimes people are isolated. Well, well, most of the time there's at least some amount of isolation for everybody. But there are always clusters of people that are becoming intentional, finding each other. And then there are whole towns that identify that way. Um, even across the Midwest, on the eastern seaboard, up in Canada, even in Mexico, and definitely along the West Coast, um, in the Rockies. Portland, Oregon is um, certainly, uh, the mo I would say, the most progressive, strongest, big city in the country, and one of the most um, visionary and ac action-oriented cities in the whole world. It's just, uh, it's a really incredible place to live, um, I mean, so many people, I hear them talking all the time about how much they love being here. They love the people. They love the fact that they talk to each other on the street. They say hello, not characterized by fear. And there's so much that's going on that is actually, it's not just anecdotal. I mean, surveys have shown not only that we're the most sustainable city in all these different indicators across the board having to do with transportation and recycling, um, most green buildings and things like that. But we now also have the nation's um, friendliest drivers, according to a recent survey. That is good, because here it's getting worse. People actually, you, you have to work to find someone honking at someone else. Um, and the road rage factor is really, is really quite lessened. I, you know, I don't work for the Chamber of Commerce going around promoting <laughs> Portland, Oregon, you know, to get companies to move there. But I want to talk about why it has changed and become... Yeah so great. I mean, we have more dog parks per capita, but all that just reflects the fact that we have more people involved participating in the process. Well, it sounds like it's more people friendly and not so maybe here. I feel like Southern California, it's automobile friendly. Yeah, I'd say that we have a lot of the same patterns. Maybe the sprawl didn't get quite as out of control, but we still um, are coming to grips with those things. The thing is, I think we, um, we have enough of a sense of a community to think about the whole city as our home. And if you have a home, for instance, you want to you wanna maintain the roof. You don't want the roof to leak because it'll ruin your investment. And we think that way about the whole city. You know, we've invested in our schools. We've invested in our libraries. And even though we do get, um, you know, officials at the, the, the state level, maybe representatives, um, that start to betray that commitment that the community has made, you know, redirect taxes uh, to, the, to the rich that then burdens people of lesser means, um, still the city has the commitment and it moves ahead all the time. When school funding is cut, parents stand up, we, we somehow try to make up the gap and we end up having some of the most outstanding schools in the nation with some of the lowest funding because we simply won't submit to that kind of um, betrayal of community on the part of elected leaders. Tell us um, how Portland has changed and what role city repair has played in that. And also, do you feel, I mean, it sounds like people are more empowered there now. Yeah, that's certainly the case. I, I, it's almost difficult, it's so difficult to even describe anymore. And I, I just, I can't keep track of all that is going on, all the incubators, all of the, uh, all of the nonprofits, um, all of the for-profit social incubators that are, 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 are existing now, up and running, and the, the, the sort of private interest ent entities that have reinvented themselves to become, not only to sort of exploit, but to support the development of, of sustainable culture, um, creative culture, 
it's just uh, it's just thrilling. I hear stories every day. I see new projects all the time as I move through the streets. I mean, it's even to the point where vegetables and fruit are are being you know sort of bursting out of the grass strips along the sidewalks. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Now, tell us what what is City Repair done in in Portland? Okay, well, City Repair was kind of put together by. Um, Let's see. I mean, speaking from my own experience as a kid that grew up in Portland in the 60s and 70s during a generation of great great momentum and, and inspiration, I'm a kid of that time. So for me, the question was how to accelerate this. I'm so, I'm so tired of the, of the disparity between the overall plight of the world and the great potential that we could be inhabiting. You know, we, like people talk about world peace. What in the world would that look like? probably would feel like a lot less anxiety than I, that, you know, the kind of anxiety that I feel when I go to sleep at night, knowing that the world is, is in such discord. And if, if world peace would mean, you know, abating that, I'm all for it. Absolutely. hundred percent. For myself and other people that, that co-founded City Repair, the question was, all right, how do we accelerate all of this? How do we take all the things that we know about the contradictions of our society and help to wake our community up to those contradictions? How do we activate them largely in their own self-interest so that they'll actually get involved? How do we do it locally so that people won't fight over issues that polarize them, you know, that turn them into so-called conservatives and liberals and progressives, and actually get them involved in things that are of common, common interest? So as we were asking that question, we, we pretty quickly came up with the answer because we knew enough about the history of the, of the Western Roman grid city that we live in um, to know that it was designed not not really to build community but just as a layout um, you know indigenous people lived here they had all of these uh, indigenous patterns place patterns settlement patterns and when um, when a when an, an empire such as the early United States is expanding into the realms of of uh, indigenous people they have to erase all those village patterns um, for one thing it's an objective of, of federal leadership, whether you're talking about the Romans or the Americans, um, to establish a new set of, of patterns that serves the interests of the nation. I think that sounds very fair-minded, um, but it's actually quite a violent process, um, also in the case of our country. Laying out of a whole infrastructure before the people moving west could even arrive or understand what was happening. And it wasn't just a big square grid. Um, it was a square mentality. It was an economy that converted the commons of the world into a commodity, and not just the physical reality, but even the way that we inhabit and experience mm -hmm. time was ordered according to a kind of grid. Is it kind of designed in response to what was here before, the indigenous peoples, the way that they um, lived? Well, it's kind of the antithesis. Mm -hmm. And again, it, you know, talking about participation, it's an anti-participatory um, formulation. Um, there's probably some people listening who are just really feeling very skeptical at this point. So <laughs> I should cite the National Land Ordinance of 1785. People can find it on uh, the Internet as the, as the Northwest Land Ordinance or the National Land Ordinance. And for some reason, they seem to give different dates. But uh, 1785 is most commonly found. And it's referred to as the National Land Ordinance because it was the prototype for everything. It was a blueprint of Roman colonial planning that was, a pro that was basically taken from the Spanish. Spanish took it from whatever evidence, whatever documents they had of Roman colonial expansion. The Americans took what the Spanish were doing and applied it over the entire Western continent with the stroke of a pen, something over 200 years ago. And it was an infrastructure for expanding um, that was designed to ensure that the West Coast would not break away from the East Coast as the East Coast had just broken away from Europe. And it had everything to do with the commons. I mean, where on the East Coast people had to seize the commons back from the British because they weren't letting us gather, right after the Revolution, the Continental Congress passes the National Land Ordinance that for the first time in the history of the Roman grid didn't include even one single gathering place. So that's why most cities and towns in the United States have to put these things back retroactively. Like Portland's main square is only 20 years old because we had to um, decide or we had to realize it was missing and then put it back. But the rest of, of what I'm saying is 
you know, a lot of people go to Mexico and Central and South America, and they notice that the towns there are grids as well, but they also have plazas and zocalos in them. And that's because the Spanish included in their, in their formulation, in their ordinance, the law of the Indies, that at least one square would be provided, one plaza would be provided for every town. And in the United States, um, it was decided that one square would not be uh, included in every town. Would you, would you say, Mark, that it seems to me that our public space is our, are our streets on some level? Yeah, and that's always been true. I mean, that's a human pattern. It's a very important thing to realize that um, in the history of, of the development, the rise of, of human um, villages, that pathways were a very important form of commons, and you didn't just you didn't just use them as a transit corridor as we do in our cities now. Um, you would speak to each other, you would interact, you would stop. There were way stations and inns along the way. It's definitely more of a pleasurable experience. And I'm not trying to romanticize the past either. Um, and I fully realize that the the arrival of the automobile changes a lot of the rules. But nonetheless, um, the hugest difference between a village um, and a grid is uh, that in a, in a village, for instance, the intersection gets to be a place where your, your pathways converge, your lives converge, and, um, and in the grid of the city, it's really only a corridor of movement, not of convergence. And the only time you really connect is if you're exchanging road rage with someone else. Yeah, you might collide, but not yeah. converge. <laughs> uh, well, I would like to say, too, that you're listening to Sustainable World on KCSB 91.9 FM in Santa Barbara. And my guest today is visionary architect Mark Lakeman of Portland City Repair, in case you just tuned in. So continue on, Mark. This is very interesting. Oh, there's just so much to say about it. I mean, it can sound all dry and clinical <laughs> once you get into history. But the thing I like about this, knowing this history, is that it, it let's see, I mean, you can you can read all kinds of different historical authors that talk about, you know, things like, well, it would really help if you could get a framework to put all your information into, and then you could put history together like a picture. The thing about the grid is it helps you to put it all together and go, oh, my God, I, I see now. I, it, history suddenly is explainable. Um, dominator patterns weave mm -hmm. throughout the whole of history, and... Uh, a lot of it can simply be explained by just seeing history as a struggle um, between the imperatives and the aggression of empire and inherent human nature trying to assert itself through the reemergence constantly of the village. Can the village coexist within the city? And how has City Repair, what are some of the projects that you've done to help create this? Well, I'll, okay, I'll describe many of them. But first of all, I'd say that to me, the village is everywhere. Um, Every time somebody does something beautiful, you see the village. Um, whether it's someone opening a door for someone or helping them get up if they've fallen, um, carrying something for an elderly person who you might not even know, just identifying with each other is, is the village. To create a bench for someone to sit on or to create something beautiful outwardly, to do something you know, just to please someone else, like painting your house a beautiful color. I mean, that pleases you, but it pleases everyone who looks. Why do we plant flowers? There's all of these different ways that we act out the, our nature to be a part of something larger than ourselves, and that's the village. It's kind of the same thing as a, as a bird. I mean, what is a bird without a nest? What is, you know, a, a fox without a den? I mean... There's a house which is an expression of ourself, and the village is the larger scale of community. Um, but you have to see that you're connected to other people in order to understand how it works. So what City Repair has done in the city of Portland is we, like going back, we decided that we wanted to do things that were catalytic, that inspired other people. We wanted to do things that um, motivated people to make their own choices so that the city would change itself and change itself faster and faster so that we would never quite know what the um, implications or ramifications or the, or the, or the what, what, what it would be that we would inspire, simply that people would start to make new choices. So we thought, okay, how do we help people address social isol isolation where they are? If they're not talking, what would happen if they did start to talk? If they're afraid now, what new choices would they make if they started to feel less fear and and have more courage in their hearts. 
actually you can start anywhere. I mean, if you're living in a place with no neighborhood gathering places, whether you're talking about a public square or a meeting house, you can build one of those. If there are places with no benches and you see elderly people walking home with their groceries and they can't afford a taxi and they're standing there resting their ligaments while they get ready to carry their groceries again to their home, you need a bench. You just have to go out and build them a bench. Um, there's all these different ways that the city can be repaired physically. I mean, you, once you go to another country like, you know, Europe or, or Africa and come back and, and then look at our own place and start to see the difference, then you can go, oh, okay, there's all these things missing. But the, the thing is, it's not what you make. It's not the physical thing you make. It's how you work with people, how you work and play, how you listen and speak. Um, the, the beautiful thing about working in the commons in this way uh, that's open-ended and inclusive, celebrates diversity, it, you know, all of these great things. It's a creative process, uh, is that you activate all of the patterns of village making, city making, um, that you ordinarily inhabit every day, but that you don't really get to participate in. Like as soon as you're listening and communicating, you're making decisions. You're actually practicing democracy because people that live in a place and act direct, directly with each other are actually practicing democracy. And anything short of that isn't really democracy. You know, casting a vote is not democracy. Um, economics. As soon as you start to share the things that you have and put it to use with other people that you live among, that's a form of sustainable economy, and it's also practice, practicing localization at the same time. And it's entirely permacultural because you're doing economics, you're doing politics, you're, um, you're, pra- you're, you're, you're sort of participating in an ecology that's driven by your values. And it's, it tends, from my experience in over 100 of these kinds of projects, they tend to be automatically sustainable because people are thinking about all of these. They, they, they just tend to think holistically. Even if they don't realize it, they're thinking holistically as much as they can all day long. So as soon as they start to do this on a community level, um, oh, my gosh. I mean, as long as some, as long as some um, straight-backed, stiff-necked architect isn't trying to control everybody, uh, they have half a chance of expressing the, the human metaphors that are, that are within them, you know, to allude the, to the things in their lives, um, to, to refer to the nature that, uh, that they adore. I mean, there's so many different ways that people are inherently poetic that will be expressed in the commons once they start to work together. Do you find that it's people of all different types, or is it just people that are, you know, the whole sustainability crowd, of their hip young people? Is this include everybody in the neighborhood? You know, I would say that, and I'm, I'm sorry to sound so, um, like, as if I know it all. Uh, but I've been in so many public meetings, and one of the things you, you do hear sometimes is people, some people will say, oh, that, that's not for me. Oh, I would never do that. Some people come out and get upset. They're like, no, no, we won't have any change. Change is always bad. Other people say, well, the only change you've ever experienced was gentrification. It was driven by someone from the outside who had come in to exploit your place. This change is going to come from us. And I've seen over and over again people that think are proud to be cynics, proud proud to be uh, sort of self-described mm-hmm. conservatives in, in, in so many different social ways become these projects' strongest advocates. And it's just a question of, of understanding. I mean, really, uh, the, the things that, that divide people and make them think they're liberal or, and, 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 uh, or, or, or conservative, that it doesn't really apply in this case. It's, uh, it's a whole different mentality especially when you're working right where you live with other people and, and you don't see them as, as combatants, as enemies. You see them as neighbors. Mark, it says on your website that city repair transforms space into place. So can you describe what that means? What's an example of that? Okay. Well, I think that, uh, you know, as you move around the city, you'll see that really every, every inch of it's been touched. It's been planned and budgeted the curbs, the sidewalks, and people have touched it, everything with their fingers um, to build it and create it. Um, so it's not as if the places we inhabit haven't been worked on, but they're really characterized more by space and not by place. Um, place is like a destination. 
It's where you want to arrive, and you'll want to linger. And space is kind of, it's utilitarian, but it's not necessarily memorable. I think memorability is, is one, one way to define place, because you can describe place, um, and you tend to have feelings about it. Um, space, space is just kind of like it's there. You can physically define it. You can measure it. It has stuff in it. Um, but it, uh, it lacks so many of the, um, of the characteristics of, of place. Uh, the fact that all sidewalks in a city, most cities are straight, from the southern end to the northern end, from the western end to the eastern end. It's as, it's as if the geography is all the same. And it is true, it's all been flattened. It used to be undulating with streams and, and forests and indigenous patterns and sacred altars, like deep human memory, littering the landscape literally. In the cities that we live in, all of that was erased. All of that time and memory and love was erased. And uh, something was laid out that was really much more of like a, just a, a, a working mentality. Like a machine almost, just linear. and Very machine-like. Yeah. That's... That was the directive of the old dead white guys that were <laughs> impelling the military to go out and take this land from the sovereign cultures who had been nur nursing it as a garden for thousands of years. And again, not to romanticize um, village culture, because, you know, I would say no indigenous culture is perfect. What was the reaction of your government or your local government to your ideas for city repair? I know you had a tea, was it a tea house or a tea that you kind of um, moved along in the city and you had um, spontaneous potlucks. What was the reaction of the city officials? Okay. Well, the, uh, the reaction initially was kind of, um, let's see, they were befuddled, but also <laughs> we were breaking rules. We weren't getting any permits. Um, we were just asserting mm -hmm. the project. And um, so they were also irritated, but, but utterly delighted. In fact, the first inspector that showed up at our project I mean, she came in and she said, okay, so you know why I'm here, um, but don't, before you say anything, I just got to say this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. And we said, well, have, have a seat. We've been expecting you. Um, we've got some chai here. It's all hot and ready. So we sat down with her, and she just started to talk um, about how she felt about her job. There's something about what we had designed in that first project just tended to melt people. Um, it was actually designed, you, you wouldn't necessarily know it consciously, but you'd walk through this really glorious, beautiful portal that was sort of like a Japanese tori through a long sort of basket-like tunnel, almost like you were moving through um, briars as a kid, this living tunnel that was like a giant woven basket. And then you'd move into this, come in, arrive in this um, hu huge, curvaceous space with all of these different levels all surrounded by doors and windows that would all open and close. So the entire thing was sheathed in, in recycled glass windows. Conifers and cherry trees and pear trees and all these flowering vines plunging up through the floor of the building and out through the roof. And all of the environments there were filled with pillows and floating tables and candles and flowering vines were crawling all over the place. And there was always the smell of tea brewing and um, dessert. Anyway, it was, it was a gigantic womb space. Mm. People would walk into the portal through the tunnel and back into a metaphorical mother, kind of like they were going back into a place that they really never had probably wanted to leave. And um, it helped people to talk to each other. I mean, our notion was, how do you help people feel, feel safe and um, help, how do you assist them in, in feeling comfortable with each other? So we thought, well, there's one space where we've all been before we knew fear and prejudice. Why don't we recreate that in an on an architectural scale, very sophisticated, almost like Mies van der Rohe had designed it or something. The old modernist German guy who um, did so many steel and glass boxes. But we took his, we took his language and turned it into this glorious um, emotional womb. And that's what started city repair. People could walk in, and without even having to, to, to know the words, they could experience... Um, sustainable economics, sustainable politics, um, sustainable ecological design, um, all patterns of sustainability existing in one place together. And you didn't have to fight about it anymore. It was like, okay, 
I'm ready to go. This is better than what I know. It's like what my um, permaculture teacher said, creating the conditions for sustainability to happen. Yeah, and I think that fundamentally, most fundamentally, uh, even, even a lot of permaculture teachers don't focus on this yet, but the basis of permaculture, as far as we're concerned, isn't just our ecological footprint. It's really, it begins with us. Um, how, do we, how do we come to make new choices? It's a social thing. It's the, the basis for permaculture, in my opinion, as far as motivating people, is, is, uh, is a social thing. It's a social permaculture. Mark, could you tell us, too, how, um, did you start with a large budget? Were you kind of a tightly knit group? How soon after you came back from your journeys did you start City Repair, and what was it like in the early days for you guys? Well, let's see. After I came back from my travels, it was 1995. And um, let's see, I was in culture shock. Coming back to the neighborhood where I had lived um, for so many years and didn't know anybody, after being in all these village cultures where people knew each other and the streets were filled with activity and relationships. Coming back to my old neighborhood was really hard emotionally, and I almost couldn't stand it. Um, when we first started City Repair, all that we knew was that we had to just start, and um, we couldn't be uh, we couldn't just be seeking permission all of the time for the things that we did. We had to initiate things directly and creatively. Let's see. So we had about 15 bucks in our pocket, I would say. And all we had was uh, the idea that we just needed to begin. We had a sense that things were missing and that only we could put them back. But what, that, what they would be um, wasn't really known. So that's, that's how we started. There was a kind of a sense of determination, a sense of, uh, of a void in our lives, and, uh, and also the knowledge that it really didn't take much. Um, but in order, to kind of, in order to kind of make progress... You, you have to let go of the idea that you need money. I mean, let's see, needing permission means that you have to fulfill all of these requirements about um, how you relate to time uh, and space and budgets. Yeah, I think that stops a lot of people from moving forward. Well, Mark, what, what would you, do you have anything else you'd like to um, tell our listeners? And also if you could mention what they might expect at your talk that is going to be happening in Santa Barbara. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, first of all, I am going to be moving up and down the coast doing these presentations, and I believe that the schedule is posted on cityrepair.org. Um, and what to expect? Let's see. Uh, I haven't quite assembled that particular presentation yet. Um, one of the presentations, I think it's at noon, will be about the sort of nuts and bolts and mechanics of city repair. How, how do you actually do it? How do you create the partnerships, um, establish new laws, break old ones, whatever you have to do um, to interface with uh, leaders and bureauc bureaucrats. Um, and, and I'm also going to be, you know, there will be people from the bureaucracy and from the political leadership there. And um, we're not going to be, you know, pointing fingers or calling names. Um, this is about win-win strategies. Um, most of the time, the stories I'll tell will be about citizen initiatives to assist leadership and, and bureaucracy in accomplishing its, old, its own sustainability and cultural community development goals. So I'll be telling stories and showing all of these illustrations of things that people will almost not be able to believe that are, are, are actually happening physically in the world. So I'll show a lot of those sorts of stories, and you'll be able to see small things, large things, huge things, and see that each one of them has the same basic set of, um, of dynamics going on that, that are making them happen. Big principles, whether they're applied at a small or a big scale. It, so that's for the nuts and bolts of city repair, and that's going to be happening. I'll give the dates after we get off the phone. And if people wanted to look up more about your projects, could you give your website information? Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. So cityrepair.org, www.cityrepair.org. Um, is the site to go to, and there's all sorts of different places you can go in there. Particularly, you can look at the Village Building Convergence, um, which is our annual project where we build a few dozen of these kind of projects all at once in the month of May. Great, and that would give people experience in this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mark, and we'll be seeing you in Santa Barbara at your talks. Okay, Jill, have a great day. Okay, thank you. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. 
For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.